All right, guys, how's it going? Welcome back. Well, today I'm in this 2016 Mercedes AMG GTS. If you're new to the channel, this is my own personal car that I've owned for about three months now, and I use it on a daily basis. And today, I thought I'd review it. When I was looking to buy one of these cars, I must have watched every single video on YouTube, but none of them really answered all of the questions that I had. So I'm hoping today to make a helpful video for anyone considering buying one. The AMG GT has been around since 2014, which is quite hard to believe because they still look brand new. They're very rare cars, you hardly ever see them on the roads, which I think helps to make them still look fresh after so many years. They attract a lot of attention, but weirdly it's the right sort of attention. You never feel like a flash, uh, let me try and keep this clean, um, so and so. I think they kind of command a bit of respect, at least more than your run of the mill supercar anyway. I know the issue of styling is subjective, but I think it's absolutely gorgeous. I think it's a classic. It's a stunning design, which I'm pleased to say was done by a fellow Brit, Mark Featherston. He's the guy that brought you the SLS, and he's also worked on the new SL55, which is a car so pretty it makes me have to cross my legs. It's unusual for a modern car design to instantly look like a classic, but this does. You can imagine this car still turning heads in 50 years' time. I absolutely love the long, imposing bonnet. It dances the fine line between elegance and menacing aggression. I love the delicate curvature of the rear. It almost looks like a water droplet. Each time I look at it, I see something different. Sometimes I see classic E-Type. Sometimes it's Porsche 928. Sometimes it's Jensen Interceptor. It's beautiful. I also love the fact that it's a nice, clean design. It isn't cluttered or overstyled. I also love the simplicity of the rear lights. There's a rear spoiler which pops into life at about 78 miles an hour, which unfortunately here in Britain means it's quite easy for people to tell if you're speeding or not. They made a model called the Edition 1 and that came with a fixed rear wing, which I think looks better to be honest. I did contemplate one of those models, but unfortunately they don't come with a glass roof, they come with a carbon fibre one. And I just thought a solid roof would make the interior feel dark and gloomy. And for somebody who lives in Stockport, where most of the time it is dark and gloomy anyway, that's the last thing I need. Whilst we're on the subject of the interior, again it's an instant classic, it's properly timeless. The interior is dominated by this curved centre console, which is quite theatrical. In fact, it's quite Porsche Panamera-esque, only with about a hundred fewer buttons. I love all the knurled dials. The volume control in particular is nice and easy to reach. It means you can turn up the volume without taking your eyes off the road. You've got other buttons down here, your engine start-stop button, your traction control, the button to adjust the suspension, the dial here to adjust the driving modes, which I'll get onto later, and perhaps my favorite button of all, controls the exhaust valves. Which immediately makes this car sound like some sort of big block muscle car. You also have buttons up here which control your heated seats and it kind of makes you feel like you're a fighter pilot. I like that, it just adds to the drama. The AMG GT comes fairly well equipped as standard, which is kind of what you'd expect from a car that was £130,000 new. You get adaptive cruise control which automatically keeps a safe distance between you and the car in front. If that slows down, you'll slow down. If that speeds up, you get the picture. You also get the Burmester audio system, which is superb. I also love how you get the display for the front parking sensors built into the gauge here. It can be quite tricky to gauge the length of this long bonnet, so they do come in handy. I also love how clear the reverse camera is. Compared to my Range Rover, it feels like it's in HD. In the GTS models, you also get keyless entry and keyless start as standard. If for some reason it doesn't recognize your key, or perhaps the key battery is flat, you can manually override that. There's an old fashioned ignition switch in precisely the last place you'd look. The actual key's a bit disappointing. You'd expect something a bit more elegant than that, wouldn't you? That's the same key that your Hermes driver has for his Sprinter. There are a couple more disappointing things too. For example, the steering wheel isn't heated and the seats aren't cooled. I know what you're thinking, first world problems. And whilst we're on the subject of disappointment, the infotainment system makes me want to scream into a pillow. It's so frustratingly complicated and it needn't be. For example, if you're using the sat-nav, you've got the nice maps display there. So, you're listening to music and you want to change song. You can't. You've got to either exit the maps and go into your media, or select this overly complicated menu here from the gauge cluster just to change track. Why? Also, when you're listening to your music, it displays exactly what you're listening to on this massive iPad, which means when you're sat at a red light, the cars either side of you can see what you're listening to which is fine if it's some indie band that you've seen live in some basement bar in the Northern Quarter, but when it's Wow by Kylie Minogue, it can be mildly embarrassing. The seats are fully electric, both driver and passenger side, and they've got a memory setting. 
With the AMG GT, there are three main models. You get the GT, the GTS, and the GTR. I put quite a bit of research into this before buying the GTS model, and I honestly think the GTS model is the sweet spot. This is the Goldilocks AMG. The standard GT comes with 450 horsepower, which, don't get me wrong, is enough, but the GTS comes with 510. And it's not just increased horsepower, the GTS comes with race mode, you get an electronically operated mechanical limited slip diff, you get keyless start as standard, you get adaptive suspension, and you get staggered wheels, so you get 19s on the front and 20 inch on the back. Then you've got the GTR version, which in my mind is a bit too hardcore. That comes with 570 horsepower, but it's also lowered, and it comes with a much lower front splitter. I wouldn't want to use a GTR on a daily basis, I just think it'd be too much. You'd constantly catch that front lip on curbs, whereas in this, you don't. As I say, I think the GTS is the sweet spot. I also think it's the best value for money, because used, this will only set you back about five grand more than a standard GT, whereas the GTR will set you back about 40 grand more than the GTS. And okay, I haven't driven a GTR, but I can't imagine it being 40 grand better than this. I love the driving position. You sit down nice and low, and all you can see is the long, muscular, bulging bonnet. It's all very evocative. I also love the chunky wing mirrors, which, to be fair, when you come in out of a side junction, they can be quite difficult to see past. When I was thinking about buying one of these cars, I had two main concerns. The first was the ride quality, and the second was the gearbox. I thought it might be painful to use on a daily basis. Thankfully, it isn't. Sure, the ride's choppier than a Range Rover, but it isn't excruciating. In fact, allow me to demonstrate. Well, here we are. I brought you to the Ancoats area of Manchester. Now, this used to be the epicentre of the world's cotton production. It's how Manchester became known as Cottonopolis. As you can probably tell, I'm a bit of a history geek. If I thought anybody would watch, I would set up a separate channel just talking about the Industrial Revolution, but I don't think anybody would watch, so I'll stick to cars. This whole area fell into a state of disrepair. All the mills were run down and desolate, and it was mainly just an area where tramps would come and sleep and, you know, probably inject themselves. But now, thanks to a massive injection of cash, some gentrification has taken place. All of these old mills have been transformed into trendy apartments for hipsters. And now on every corner there's a trendy bar, cafe or restaurant. You know the kinds of places I'm talking about. They're all gluten-free and everybody drinks oat milk because basically cow's milk is poison, isn't it? The only reason I brought you here, apart from the fact that I'm about to have breakfast in one of these trendy places, is that all the roads, apart from this one that I've chosen, which was bad timing, are cobbled. So I thought it would be a good test for the AMG suspension. I've just caught my reflection in these shop windows. It's such a good looking car, this. Makes me smile every time I see it. Right, we're on a cobbled road. And yeah, things start to get quite shaky. You can hear my keys shaking in the cup holder. My parcel shelves vibrating. But for this kind of car, it isn't too bad. Yeah, I wouldn't want to suddenly move to Weatherfield, but it's, it's okay, it's tolerable, isn't it? My teeth haven't fallen out yet. Can you imagine doing this in some kind of Lotus or Ferrari or Lamborghini? I think that'd be torture. With regards to the engine, the 4-litre twin-turbo, I would have actually preferred it if they'd have used the old 6.2 naturally aspirated V8. Performance figures wouldn't have been that different. And I just think one day I'm going to have a horrendous bill when one or both of my turbos fail. Whereas with the old 6.2, obviously that isn't an issue. My other concern was the DCT gearbox. It's a seven-speed twin-clutch box. I worried that around town it might feel clumsy and hesitant, as they often do. Thankfully, it doesn't. I mean, yes, when you're trying to park this, occasionally you don't get the standard creep feature like you get on a normal auto, but it isn't bad. In fact, it's one of the best I've used. One thing I don't like is the actual positioning of the gear lever itself. It's too far back. It should have been here, or they could have mounted it onto the column like most Mercedes. I think this has been designed with Jeremy Beadle in mind. One thing I wasn't prepared for, though, is the road noise. It does get very loud, this, at higher speeds. You wouldn't want to do a long motorway journey in this, because it is a bit loud. When I'm on my own and I've got my music playing, it isn't an issue. But if you sat here with a passenger and you're trying to have a conversation, or, for example, you're trying to take a call on the Bluetooth, all you can hear is the loud hum from the tyres, and eventually you'll be able to spot some blood dripping from your ears. Let's move on to running costs, then. Now, these are my real-world running costs. The first pleasant surprise was the road tax. You'd expect this to sit in the highest bracket, wouldn't you, of £600 a year? Well, it doesn't. It's only £340 a year. A full tank of fuel used to set you back around £90. Now, for various geopolitical reasons, it'll set you back around £110. And from that tank, you're going to get around 300 miles. 
I've noticed this does around 19 or 20 miles per gallon around town and it'll do 29, 30 miles per gallon on a motorway run. So if you work on the principle that the combined MPG is about 24, 25 miles per gallon, it really isn't too bad. It's about three or four MPG better than my old SL55. I found the servicing cost to be fairly reasonable too. As soon as I bought this, I immediately booked it in with SPR Autos in Stockport, who are a Mercedes specialist, and I know them and trust them well enough to work on it. They did an engine service and they fixed an issue I had with the heater fan. A couple of leaves had got lodged in the blower motor, so every time I turned my heater on, it made a racket. That cost around £300. They also did a gearbox service for me, because these DCT gearboxes are due a service every 40,000 miles or four years. And now although this had only done 21,000 miles, it was five or six years old, so it was due a service time-wise. That cost me around £400, but at least now I know it's done for another four years. It also needed a set of front tyres, they cost me £250 each. Then I had the wheels refurbished at a place called Prestige Wheels in Bredbury. That sent me back around £100 per wheel, because they're large and they're diamond cut. In terms of practicality, it scores very well. You get a large boot, which is capable of swallowing up a decent sized suitcase. It's more spacious than you'd expect for a sports car like this. Moving inside you get a couple of shallow door pockets, a decent sized glove box, and you get more storage under this centre armrest, which has the nice embossed AMG logo on it. You also get two nice deep cup holders here, which is perfect for throwing all your belongings in. I found it perfectly practical to use on a daily basis. It certainly isn't cramped like a, like a Jaguar F-Type. Now the main selling point of the AMG is what lies beneath that long attractive bonnet. It's a 4-litre twin turbocharged V8, and it sits so far back it's actually behind the front axle, so this car's technically mid-engined. Perhaps this car should be all-wheel drive, but it isn't. It sends all of its power, and there's quite a lot, to the rear wheels alone, which can be... terrifying, I'll be honest. Terrifying. This car's capable of 193 miles an hour. It'll do naught to 60 in 3.8 seconds. It's certainly the quickest car I've ever owned, if not driven. The problem is though, putting that power down, because it just has a tendency to spin. You have various driving modes. You have I, which stands for individual, so you can set it exactly how you like. You have C for comfort, which is where my car spends most of its life. Then you've got S for sport, or S plus for sports plus. Or you've got race mode. I usually keep mine in comfort, unless I'm at some traffic lights next to a hot hatch and I just want to show them who's boss. If you switch it to Sport or Sport Plus, then the suspension firms up and your exhaust valves open. And it starts to really growl and bark like a rabid dog. I hope you can hear this on the microphone. On the downshifts it really pops and bangs. If you pop it into race mode, then it gets really quite hardcore. Let me try and demonstrate. So we're in third gear now, let me change down to second. It's brutal. You might think the whole drive mode thing is a bit of a gimmick, but I like it. It gives this car a sort of Jekyll and Hyde personality. You can drive it sedately when you want to, but you know the whole while, at the touch of a button, turn into an absolute handful. What else can I tell you about it? Oh yeah, if you're over 50, getting in and out of it can be a bit of an issue. It's that low to the ground, you do have to be quite flexible. But happily, once you're in it, there's plenty of room. Plenty of headroom, plenty of legroom, and the seats are very comfortable. In terms of what it's like to drive, it's beautiful. Yes, it can be a bit of a handful when you want to try and put the power down, but the steering is so good. I know it's a bit of a cliche, but it's, it's telepathic. It knows exactly what you want to do before you even tell it. And it's just so special. Every time I walk up to it or I catch my reflection in a shop window, I just get a wry smile on my face. As you start to get a move on, you can feel and really appreciate how well balanced it is. And yes, you've got to show it some respect, especially in the wet, because it can be quite slippery, but it is a lot of fun. For me, it's the perfect sports car. I love it. I've got absolutely zero plans to part with it, mainly because I don't know what I'd replace it with. I mean, where do you go from this? I wouldn't really, I don't think, want a supercar of some description because you just can't use them on a daily basis. And this does everything that I would want from this kind of car. One thing I love about the GT is the scarcity value, or the rarity. You hardly ever see them. 
where it's something like an Audi R8 is a bit of a village bike. Everyone's had one or had a go. Here in the UK, you can pick up higher mileage example GTs with 50 or 60,000 miles on the clock for around 60 grand. For a nice low mileage one like this, it's only done 21, 22. I expect to spend around 10 grand more. Yes, I know that's a lot of money. I haven't completely lost touch with reality. But in this segment, it isn't a lot of money. It's an awful lot of car for its 70 grand price tag. Well, thank you once again for watching. If you're new to the channel and you've just come here just because you're considering buying an AMG GT, then go for it. You really won't regret it. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe. Give the video a thumbs up because it really helps with the old YouTube algorithm. If you've got any questions or comments, let me know below. And I'll do my best to get back to you. So yeah, cheers guys. I'll see you next time.